Good morning. Um, thank you for, for joining us uh, this morning. My name is John Fritz. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Instructional Technology and New Media here at UMBC. Um, I'd like to introduce Joan Costello, too. Joan, for the UMBC folks, is our uh, WIMBA support contact, so keep Joan in mind, um, and she'll be circulating throughout the morning here. I just put in the next building, academic four. Right. Um, we're very pleased and appreciative of uh, the folks from WIMBA for sponsoring our brunch this morning. Um, it's interesting, one of the things we talk about in the hybrid program development all the time is how do you solve your absent presence? Uh, either as an instructor or as a student, but when you go online, you have to deal with the fact that people aren't there anymore. And, uh, we've got to figure out how to make those connections uh, the same as well. Hello. Um, so, um, you know, we've got a, an, an interesting program for you here. I'm going to turn it over to Mark Bevenar, uh, who is our uh, representative with WIMBA. And again, really appreciate, Mark, what you folks have done to make the effort to come down here and sponsoring this for us. No, no, thank you, John. Thank you for uh, to everyone on your team as well for helping us put today, uh, to, uh, together today's event. Uh, we have three, uh, potentially four speakers today. No pressure. <laughs> Uh, and basically, we're just going to uh, allow the faculty members just to share some best practices. Uh, at the end of the presentations, I'm going to go through, uh, we're going to have a box lunch that's going to come around 11.30. And uh, at the end of the, uh, when the box lunch comes, there'll be just a <coughs> brief summary of the WIMBA tools. And uh, we actually have a, a, a new program, which is called Quick Start, for uh, some of the smaller schools that we'll talk about. But again, um, the three presentations that we have today, again, they're very good, and uh, I learn as much as anybody when I listen to the faculty members talk about their challenges in teaching in uh, blended and online environments as well. So uh, I think uh, we're going to start it off with the UMBC people first, and uh, if you want to. Okay. Hi. My name's Alyssa. Um, you thought this was the first row, but since no, oh, there, there is a first row, so I'll move back. Alyssa Eisenberg, and I teach in a couple of different departments. I teach management, leadership, communication for students who are in the graduate schools of engineering management and biotech. And uh, my goal in creating a hybrid course was to not just have it be something that would make it easier for everybody and get people off the road, but also have it be a learning opportunity for the students. So although my uh, presentation today is titled maintaining student involvement and maintaining learning integrity in the hybrid courses, what I really wanted to do was teach people and, and give people an, an opportunity to experience being managers, team leaders, and, and team members when you are not face to face. Many of my students are working with people who are uh, all over the world, or they could be in the same town, but they're working from home. People are working from all over the United States. They're working different hours. They're working in different time zones. And yet, my students have to be able to delegate work to those folks. They have to evaluate the work that their employees are doing, even if they never get to see it in person. They have to be able to uh, inspire others to do their best jobs. And they have to promote themselves, all very often without ever seeing the people that they're working with. So I really wanted this course to not just use the hybrid tools to be a teaching tool, but also use the hybrid tools to help them become better employees and leaders in their non-face-to-face -face environments. So today I'm going to just talk about how, uh, what I learned in terms of using the hybrid tools that exist and hopefully share some things that you can use. So first of all, just the tools that I used in my hybrid course, obviously I used Blackboard. I used Wimba Live Classroom. Um, I used wikis. I used it both for the individual teams to do their work, and I also used it for the whole course. I used Discussion Board. I used Wimba Voice Emails, but I only did it once per semester. I did it sort of as a little booster kind of thing partway through the semester. I think if I sent a voicemail every week or so, it might get to be um, I don't know, less of a pop out of it. And I used e-lectures. And I think any tool you use for e-lectures is fine. I happen to use Jing, which was a free tool, five-minute limit. 
Um, and I also got screen flow, which worked well for me. So I'm just going to go through some of these, except for Blackboard, because everybody knows about that. But some basic things that I learned about teaching hybrid. The first thing is that before you begin your semester, make sure that everything is loaded onto Blackboard. All the deliverables are there. Everything you intend for them to learn week by week. What all the lectures should be up there. Any ancillary materials. My students are, um, you know, they might be having a baby in December, or they might be going to Korea in October. They want to be able to know just how much is going to be due on those weeks that they might be gone. They might want to do December's work in November. And er if everything is there, they can look through the whole semester and say, OK, I can, I can take this class even though I have to travel or I have to be away for different reasons. So I get everything up there in advance. I also learned that it's critical to be very consistent. I am not a detail-oriented person. So this is a huge challenge for me. But I have learned over the last couple of years, especially if you're teaching in a hybrid format, the students need everything to look the same. So if you have deliverables, all the deliverables throughout the semester should use the same uh, icons, the same fonts. It should just look the same, even to the point where if you're going to say your tasks this week are A, B, C, D, next week they shouldn't be 1, 2, 3, 4. Because really, those students don't get to sit in the classroom and, and look at your face and ask you questions. They have to be able to follow things. And so the things that you present to them online have to be very consistent. I also created icons to represent specific actions that they should take. Um, probably not terribly necessary, but it does make it a little easier for students who won't be coming to class on a certain week to see, is this a week that I have teamwork? And they can look up the deliverable week. And if the icon for teamwork is there, they know, oh, this is a week. Even if I'm going to be traveling, I'm going to have to interact with my team. I learned that it's going to take, it takes much more time to teach via hybrid than it does live in class. There is significantly more preparation. And there's a lot more work that you do during the semester. This was a little bit of a shock, although other people told me you'd think I would have gotten that in, in my head. And yet, it's. It's still surprising as it happens. We have to be involved online if we expect our students to be involved online. So it adds this whole other level of, of communication work that has to be done. I also think it's really critical that your students expect to be self-directed. A student who comes to class every single week sits there. They have to bring their homework because they have to hand it in. They know you're going to ask certain questions and it's going to be live. They have to be prepared. But when they work online, it's all up to them. If they're late, there's nobody standing there saying, where is it? They have to get it done on time. So forewarn your students that they have to be self-directed. Just a little bit more about the criticality of that. I will share with you that the most highly disciplined students in my summer hybrid class I would say learned nearly as much as a pretty good student in my full semester class. Now, summer is already a challenge because it's condensed into 10 weeks rather than 15. But we also had hybrid. Uh, the other thing I would share with you, if you teach a class that's hybrid at any time, but especially if it's condensed into the summer, is that students think, oh, this is going to be easy. I don't have to go. I don't have to show up half the time. I could take a vacation. And they don't realize that you're going to have a lot of work to do, even if your body won't be in the chair Monday at 7 o'clock. So I kept giving this message out. If you're going to take a summer vacation, it should start August 12. And if you have to travel for work, you might want to take this class during another semester when there are more weeks to make up that loss of time. So I just kept getting that message out, and most of them got it. I think one of the best things about the hybrid class that I taught, and I'm very excited about it, is that everybody learned, including me, how to be a member of a team that is not face-to-face, -face, how to be a member and a leader and, a, and a, a, a part of a team that is not co-located. And that is where a lot of our students are going to be finding themselves in the future. 
So I'm very excited about that. Okay, for wikis, I created a wiki for the class, and I also had the teams create wikis. I don't know if you'll find this. My students are older. They were all very nervous about the whole wiki idea. I don't know how to use a wiki, never heard of it. You know, it just seemed a little overwhelming to them. So what I would recommend and what I did that worked was I created a simple sign-up sheet wiki. And they had to go there and sign up for something. And just that action let them see, oh, it, this is really easy. All I have to do is click edit. And then the team started to use it. I also really sold the idea of wikis. Anytime I could have a side conversation with someone, I'd say, is your team using a wiki? Oh, you should look at the wikis. Because it's a great collaboration tool. And again, that's one of the things they have to learn in my class. Um, if they do use a wiki, they have to realize that they need to create some norms. They have to decide up front, are they going to let the history take care of keeping track of who did what, and the whole team can make changes to a main document, or do they want to have everything shown on the front page? Just little things you want to walk them through. If you haven't used a wiki yourself, and you're at UMBC here, I strongly advise it. It's a fantastic collaboration and communication tool. It's very easy. It's, it's really not, um, you know, when I first heard about wikis, I thought, oh, great, one more piece of technology for me to learn. Like, that's just not my skill set. But it's just like using Word, except that anybody can add to it, delete from it, make alterations. So it's a really great system. Discu what happened? What? Oh, yes. Oh. Okay, the next speaker is going to talk about a wiki. Okay, so you'll have some time. She'll show you. But I would say, compared to discussion board, it is so much cleaner. Okay. Discussion boards have thread, 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 and click on each one. And, or you can collect them all, but it won't tell you that you've read them all. It, it, that can be very frustrating. I'm, I was just like you four months ago. I'm like, oh, great, something new to learn. But I love it. Uh, and it's a very easy way to get people to sign up for things and to, to communicate with your students and have them report back to you. Um, for discussion boards, I created all my forums before the semester began. Again, for a hybrid class, I like to have everything up there. And that's one of the things I did. And I have starter questions to get people talking. One of the things I want to use the discussion board for in a hybrid format is to get that talking back and forth. My class is really dependent upon the students learning from each other, sharing their experiences, getting advice and ideas and coaching. On, and we have to use these online tools. So I created those forums with starter questions. And I would advise you, if you use discussion boards, to comment early and often. I think I thought, when I first started the discussion boards, that I would be like a moderator of the discussion boards. But you're not just the moderator. You're also a participant. I've also discovered that if I go in there early and write some things in there, students start to follow that same model that I used. So if I write really clearly and in complete sentences and there's no text language, next thing you know, the students are writing sort of that same way. Which I think is important given that they're writing, they're trying to write professionally. I do realize that people in their 20s know how to read text speak, but they are going to be faced with you know, middle-aged people like me at some point who have no idea what they're saying. So they have to be able to sell their ideas to us. Uh, so that works out well. I created an Ask Me forum where they could ask questions, hello, and, um, you know, get advice from me. They could, they could uh, write things um, without putting their names on it if they wanted to. Um, I require students to use full sentences in the subject line. I know that sounds insane. Who uses a full sentence in a subject line? Here's what happens if you do not. You get a discussion board that says something like the first form is ideas. And then you get re-ideas, re-re-ideas, re-re-re-ideas. Re Who the heck knows what the tenth thing is actually about? Why would you click on it and read it? How would you get any kind of debate going from something that is 16 re's down on the list? You can't. So they have to use a complete sentence, and when they respond to someone else, they should use a complete sentence. And that complete sentence should be, 
a summary of their main argument so that people know just what they're going to be looking for when they read your discussion posting. It's forcing them to use a very different way of thinking when they're doing discussion boards. And I have noticed over the course of the semester that they've started to send emails where the subject line is a complete sentence. And the subject line gives you a clear idea of what's in that email. This is critical for communication. Many of us get 100 emails a day. These folks are going to work and getting hundreds of emails a day. I want them to be able to persuade others in email, coach others in email, delegate work in email. And you can't do that if the subject line is, hi. So they're learning how to sort of use all this. I have them self-grade their posting. I do a lot of self-grading because I want to make sure we're on the same page. If somebody thinks that they did A work and I think they did C work, we need to sit down and talk. If uh, I think they did A work and they think they did C work, we should talk. Something's not right. So I have them do a lot of self-grading. I used a rubric that I got from a discussion board on um, Sloan C, which I'll mention in just a minute. Someone shared their rubric. I asked if I could use it. They said, sure, it's fantastic. And by the way, we take points away if your subject line is not a complete sentence. So they know exactly what to expect in that. My e-lectures, never more than eight minutes. I don't tend to lecture anyway, so it's not that hard. If you use a jing, it forces you to only do five minutes anyway. I always ask a question at the end of the lecture. I don't want you falling asleep or doing your nails or checking your email. So you have to be paying attention. There's a question at the end. You go to the discussion board and contribute to some discussion that had to do with that lecture. I use a headset mic. I recommend it. It takes away from any risk of outside noise coming in. It only cost me $5. So it was a pretty good deal. If you want the name of it, let me know. I'll, I'll get it to you. Um, when I'm doing an e-lecture, my slides are different than they are when I'm talking to you like this. This is, gee, I don't even know if you can see that. Can you see that? Black and white? Kind of much, turned out much smaller than I thought it would. But basically, my slides are not full of bells and whistles. When I do talk to students, the slides are just very clear statements that summarize what I'm talking about. But when I'm doing an e-lecture, I've realized that I need to keep people involved. So I have a lot more slides. There are a few more bells and whistles. There's a little more going on in an e-lecture slide than I normally would. Um, change the slides frequently so that it's you know, they keep involved. And I personally like to stand up and walk around. Um, it keeps me sort of energized. My first few online lectures were really boring because I was talking like I was reading a pamphlet. So I realized that I have to pretend that there's human beings around me. <laughs> you could talk to your plants or your cat or whatever happens to be around you because you want to be as if you're talking to a human being. OK, live classroom. I used Live Classroom, which is probably why you're all here today, because my course depends upon interactive learning. And Live Classroom is a fantastic tool to enable you to talk to students, students talk to you, students talk to each other. It's as if they're sitting right next to each other. They can have a conversation with another person. Um, th again, they need to learn how to manage co-located teams. My hope is that they can persuade their companies to use a tool like Live Classroom because most of them are having meetings with people who are far away using things like um, teleconferences. And a lot is lost in a teleconference that is made up for in the live classroom. We have a whiteboard. We have all sorts of things that you can use that are very similar to being face to face, except I can't see your expressions. It also helps maintain that connection that gets lost during the non-classroom weeks in a hybrid class. So I use it when we don't have a classroom week. In class week, it creates that dialogue. Um, it creates some debate. Some of my students who tend to be more quiet in front of their classmates were much more involved online. They were very comfortable hitting that talk button and speaking when they didn't have to look everyone in the face. Um, it maintained that learning community and helped develop that learning community that they had started to create at their tables in class. Uh, with the condensed schedule, it enabled me to get 15 class periods in. With a regular schedule, it enables people to feel connected to UMBC and to the <coughs> class during their non-live classes. I also hold office hours using Live Classroom during um, between weeks. 
here's what went well. The small groups you can have um, in live classroom, people go into small groups and have discussions amongst themselves. Students loved that. They felt like they had an intimate learning environment. They reported that they learned a great deal. They reported being very comfortable in the online environment. And they appreciated being able to go back and review points that they thought were most interesting. If you haven't seen the live classroom page, when you archive, if you're giving a live classroom, always archive it. Now it's really dark. Hello. <laughs> Don't fall asleep. OK. If you're giving a live classroom, always archive it. And tell your students in advance you're going to archive it. Because you want to have a tool. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you go up and down. Um, you want to have a tool that students can go back to, or if they miss the class, they can see it. But when the archive shows up, you've got your whiteboard on one side, and on the other side is a, is a timeline. And it'll say, for example, conflict at two, two minutes, um, team discussion, four minutes. And that'll just go all the way down for your whole time that you were needing. So a student could say, well, oh gosh, I remember there being something important about team communication and a conflict. Uh, let me look it up. And they can go through and see at 16 minutes we had a discussion about how to manage conflict on a team. And they can just watch that piece of it. Students loved being able to go back to it. I had students reporting that they did that at work. They showed their colleagues, hey, we have this, we need to figure out our team situation. And they went back to their archived work and were able to uh, call up the piece they wanted to. OK, prepare your students. You do not want to waste time with them saying, how do I talk? I can't talk. I can't hear you. My computer isn't working. It's, you're just, you, blah, it just drives me nuts. So I created an e-lecture. They have to watch the e-lecture before our online live classroom um, period. And the e-lecture tells them exactly how to use Live Classroom. We want them to go to Live Classroom, to click on it, and to run their diagnostic. If you've been to Live Classroom, you see it has that, a menu that pops up. Click here if you've never used this before. Click here if you've already run your diagnostic. You must have them run their diagnostic before class begins. Otherwise, you're spending five minutes waiting for them. So I tell them that in the e-lecture. Let them know it'll be archived. One of the things I learned is I want them to turn off their own hand raises. This is just a weird little pet peeve. But if you've got 30 people and they raise their hand to answer a question and one or two of them answer it and all of those hand raises stay up, you find yourself saying, oh, so-and-so, do you have your hand up? Oh, no, no, you're answering the other question? OK. So-and-so, uh, do you have your hand up? So it, <laughs> it becomes critical that they manage that kind of stuff. They raise their hand. They get called on or they don't. They click on the hand raise. If you ask a yes or no question, they can click on an X for no and a check mark for yes. I want them to turn that off themselves. Otherwise, I'm doing two jobs. I'm being a technician and I'm teaching a class. I would encourage them to use a headset mic. Now, if they don't have one, that's fine. They can call in. I don't want them to use the mic on their computer. Otherwise, we get feedback and it's very frustrating. I recommend that you learn everything possible before you begin. Um, it's just a lot more comfortable if you have done this before, before you start talking to a group of students. And I have just another thing about that in just a moment. Don't lecture. If you're going to lecture, you can do an e-lecture. The purpose of the live classroom is to be interactive. Okay, as for preparing, I would advise to practice with a colleague first. I had the good fortune of uh, Chris Morris agreed to spend an hour pretending to be a student, and we both got on live classroom, and we could figure out what the glitches were like. So I really recommend practicing. I think otherwise it could be very uncomfortable to try to do a live classroom for the first time with 20 or 30 students trying to learn from you. Okay, I just want to talk for a moment about empty space. I am going to be the only person who talks to you about Live Classroom that gives you this advice. And I know this because I have taken every Live Classroom class that has been taught, and they all give the opposite advice. But here's my take. Empty space. People are terrified of empty space. If you are on the radio, you can't have dead air. People will change the cha station. But when you're in a class and you ask a question that is introspective, that you want them to think about, you have to have dead air. Otherwise, they can't think. Every live classroom class I have taken, the instructor says, don't let there be dead air. People will you know, lose their attention. It'll be boring. It's horrible in the archive. Too bad. 
too bad. I want you to think. That's why I give empty space. When I'm in a class and I ask a question, I do not pick up the first hands that are raised if it's a question that requires a thoughtful response. Right? Neither do you, right? You don't do that. You don't want to get top of mind things. I want you to think. And I might stand here and breathe and count to 10. And at that 10th number, then you see the lights go on. They raise their hands, and they give very thoughtful responses. I want the same experience in my live classroom. So when you take a live classroom class and they say, OK, make sure you don't have any dead air. If you ask a question that requires thought, ask it another way and another way and another way until somebody answers. Doesn't that drive you nuts? Or put something up on the screen for people to see, and it, and it maintains their interest. If it's maintaining their interest, they're not thinking about the question I asked them. So to prove to you that it takes the same 10 seconds, I have a little piece here. This is the first question that I asked to a, what would be in a, a live classroom group. This was my first question. So. OK? Look at that. It took the same 10 seconds. Nobody fell apart. And if my students miss the live classroom and they have to take it, watch the archive, their job is to answer the questions, too. I don't want them watching passively. I want them taking notes and being prepared to have learned something. And you can't learn something when you're passively watching. That's my personal belief, anyway. You can't learn something passively watching. I want them engaged and involved. And so I tell them, if you are watching the archive, your job is when I ask a question to write down your own answer and to think about how you might respond to someone else's answer. OK, so I don't have a problem with, the, with those empty spaces, and I just wanted to share that. A little more advice. Invite the whole class. I thought that it would be best to have just five students at a time. But let me tell you, it is exhausting to run the same program five times. There's something very tiring about having the thing on your head and being in a place, to me, uh, for five hours. So I, my, my next one, I'm going to be having the entire class invited. Um, I also have a moderator, thank goodness, for my next one. That person will help me watch for hand raises. I strongly recommend this. Otherwise, you're spending a lot of time making sure you don't miss anybody's hand raise uh, and watching for written comments and questions. Use those breakout rooms so you can still create the intimacy of a learning environment. Um, prepare, prepare, prepare. Preload your PowerPoint slides. You don't want to be trying to do that while the students are sitting there talking to you. Everything should be preloaded. And you can do all that. You can have as many files up there. I don't know how many files you can have, but you can have several. You can have access to your own computer, and you can take them to different places. But always be prepared in advance for that. Make sure the students have something in front of them besides their computer screen. I always have them have a handout with questions and such that I might ask. Because just as you come to class with paper and pen, if they're sitting in their office or at home taking the online class, but they don't have any paper and pen, they're not ready to learn. So I start off. You're ready. You've got your handouts. Everyone have a pen. If you don't have a pen, put down the phone and go get one. <laughs> don't start late. Don't rush participants. These are just a few things that I, I strongly advise. And don't allow students with technology challenges to delay the start. I start on time. I end on time. If I waste 10 minutes trying to help an individual with their phone, everybody else has lost interest. So yes? Um, First of all, I do have that e-lecture, and they're supposed to have seen that before they take it. And in there, I say, take care of your tech problems in advance. The second thing I'm doing is I'm having a moderator. If you have a tech problem, you go to the bottom. Um, you don't send a message to the whole room. You can send a message to a specific person. So tell Patrick having a tech problem, and Patrick will talk to you specifically. Uh, otherwise, it interrupts everybody. I also talk it up. The week before, I'm going to have a live classroom. I say all that stuff all over again. Make sure you, if you don't have a headset mic, make sure your phone has a, a mute button. And please test your equipment before you start. Just because it worked on the computer at work does not mean it will work at the computer at home. You have to run that diagnostic any time you switch computers. All that stuff, I just talk a lot. I say it over and over. 
Um, okay. Give students jobs, keep them working. Um, you can hand over your whiteboard to a student. So you can give people the, the opportunity to be the note takers. You can have group reporters for your breakout rooms, just another way to keep people working, keep them involved. Recommend buying a headset mic. Pretend you're in person again. Pretend you can see the people. Now, if you have to use a live classroom before you're going to physically see your students, which is going to happen here because we're probably going to start having our classes be every other week so that we can share space. That means that the instructor who is starting the second week will have to have had a class that first week using live classroom. I would advise putting your picture in the corner. I was not able to use the um, a camera because it used so much bandwidth that it slowed everything down. You, you could use a camera and people could see you, but it really slowed things down. So I don't usually put my picture up, but if the students had never seen me before, there's something very comforting about them seeing a face with the voice. There's something a little more real about it. So put your picture up if they haven't seen you. I recommend you work from campus. Your situation might be very different from mine. I had the very good fortune of buying a house from an artist who had built an art studio attached to the house. And this seemed like the perfect office. It's separate from the house, but it's attached. And yet, I could hear those kids upstairs complaining about going to bed and running around. It didn't work. So I'm going to be leading my live classrooms from campus. Um, I give credit for attendance. Uh, it's not a whole heck of a lot, but it's like a point. I'd like you to show up. Um, I recommend learning as much as possible about distance teaching before you start teaching. If you can take an online course in your subject matter, it's a really great experience to see what it's like to be a learner in your subject. So I took a management class online. And it was really fascinating for me to see how I learned when I wasn't there able to talk to other people. I also recommend the Sloan C programs. UMBC has um, something called a campus pass or something like that, college pass, and you can take a few classes. They're really good. I took Sloan's um, online course development basics, and it was very basic, and it walked you through how to set up a course and how to teach the class. It was great. And they had a discussion forum that I used extensively to get advice, to give advice, to share rubrics. I strongly recommend them. UMBC has great programs. Come to everything. I go to all the Blackboard tutorials. All of the, they have hybrid workshops here. This, the, I'm not sure which schools you're all representing, but probably your school is set up to help, help you be prepared to teach in this forum. And WIMBA has, if you go to the WIMBA website, they have quick start tutorials. They have uh, workshops online that you can take. They have things archived that you can look through. They have lecture series and so forth. Strongly recommend all of that stuff. Again, as I said earlier, it does take longer to set up a, a hybrid class because if you've never done it before, you not only are changing the format of your class and the way you're reaching people, but you also have to learn how to use the tools to, the best, to, to their best advantage. So these three um, uh, resources are fantastic. <coughs> and those are just my icons that I mentioned earlier so that a student can see, if they see a picture of that book, this week they have to be reading that book. If they see a picture of the discussion board, this week they need to be having a discussion on the discussion board. Just um, basically took pictures of the uh, stuff online and used it so they could recognize where to go. And again, it's just there um, to make things easier for the students so that everything is consistent and things are both graphical as well as verbal. As People learn, as you know, in so many different ways. So I try to approach them in many different ways. And that's all I have. Mm -hmm. Any questions or concerns or? <clears throat> Sorry if I went on too long. Yes. That's always a challenge. If I have a week that is not in class, I try to do the live classroom at the same time as the class. So my classes are Mondays. I have two classes, 4 to 7 and 7.15 to quarter to 10. And so I try to run it at this, those same times because they have already mapped out that time for themselves to be available. I, for example, I do have one, for example, this Sunday at 4. And I put up a wiki uh, questionnaire, what would be best for people, and they voted. 
So, yes. Be willing to share what? Oh, well, see, I have a big thing about being late, so you're just out of luck. I'm sorry. <laughs> you missed that. See, I talked about that. No, my name's Alyssa Eisenberg. I teach here at UMBC, and I would be happy to share the presentation. Yes, if you want to give me your email address, I can send it to you. Just so folks know, we are also taping this, and we'll be making it available. Uh, so if you're on the sign-up sheet, we will send out the email showing you where the location is. Yes, sir. Now, did I hear you correctly? We're having trouble with the video uh, in terms of, of bandwidth with the live class or I did. And did you try tweaking it at all? Did I try what? Did you try tweaking the bandwidth on the video? In terms of I wouldn't know how to do that. Okay. <laughs> I'm, again, sitting at home, clicking on my, uh, if there's a way to do it, that'd be great. I'll yes. Okay. I don't think they really need to see my face. <laughs> they know what I look like. Yes. When administration requires you to put your office hours, how do you, what do you, what do you do? My office hours? Yeah. I am, I sit with my live classroom up and I have my headphones on and I put my camera on for that. And I just, I'm working and I'm just there as if I have an office that they come to. I don't actually have an office. And students can just arrive and start asking me questions. No, what I'm saying, like, usually in some schools, you have to send up the pep some paperwork to administration. Oh. To say these are my office hours where students can see. How do you do it with this idea? I would do it the same way. I'd say my office hours are Mondays from 3 to 4, okay. and I am physically present. You just can't physically see me. <laughs> I mean, actually, you can see me, but you can't touch me. <laughs> I guess that's the only thing you can do, because you can see me. I could see them if they had a camera. No one's ever asked me for my proof of office hours, but I guess I could pull it together if I had to. <laughs> Anyone else? <coughs> yes. I, um, my use of Wimba would include a lot of demonstrations, live demonstrations. Are there technical issues that we've got to investigate about this bandwidth thing and the way that stuff gets transmitted? Okay, so let me start with the bandwidth thing. I was working from home. I am sure that if you're on campus, bandwidth issue is not like it is at home in, in Alyssa's house. Is that, is bandwidth an issue if you're on campus? No. <laughs> Only when it's down. <laughs> you know what, in the live classroom class that I took here, they had, the instructor had a camera, we could all see him, and he did things like uh, transferred his computer to us. Now that takes a lot of bandwidth, and we had no problem. Yes? Uh, you mentioned something about a grading rubric used for either a, a, a discussion board exercise, mm -hmm. like it's peer-to-peer, -peer, I, I believe, or peer review, or was it your particular rubric that... Uh, using. It's my rubric, they grade themselves, and at the end of the semester, they send me their top three postings, which I learned from another instructor. They send me what they believe to be their top three po postings, and then I put it through my, the rubric again and, and grade that as the discussion board postings grade. So they are graded <coughs> for it, but they're not graded for every single time, or I'd spend hours doing that. I have, um, they do some peer-to-peer -peer grading because they grade their teammates, teammates' contribution. Something you'd be willing to share? I, yeah, I got it from another instructor. I'm happy to share it. Or give you, give you an email, you can. Yep. Okay, super. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, I've probably taken up more than my fair share of time, so I will turn the floor over. Thank you. Wow. So we have Anna here uh, from UMBC. Uh, and uh, thanks for time to me. All right. Well, Thank you everybody for coming and welcome to the presentation. I am Anna Scott and I teach in the Modern Languages and Linguistics Department. I'm going to talk today. Yeah, do you think you can speak as a, um, Louder? As a microphone? Maybe? That's just recording now. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. Oh my God. Okay, let's see if I can talk loud. 
All right, I'm going to talk about what I am doing in one of the advanced classes that we teach in the Mother Languages and Linguistics Department, in particular in Spanish area. So I'm going to start with a presentation talking about the class, and I'm going to describe <coughs> the tools that I am using to enhance the students' writing, which are wikis and chats. I'm going to describe the writing procedure, how we go about using them to enhance the collaborative writing, and what I believe are the benefits of using these two tools. So <clears throat> the class I'm going to talk about is an advanced Spanish writing class 401601, which is one of the capstone courses in the Spanish area. This course is also one of the writing intensive courses taught at the department. And as such course, we emphasize the writing process, we emphasize giving feedback to the students, and we emphasize the planning and everything that implies process in the writing. And the, the, in the course, we do several writings. We work with several genres. We wrote with narratives, we wrote with descriptions. But the way I see the course is focused on academic writing. In particular, we focus on argumentative and exposition essays. Now, academic <coughs> writing, if we think about it, is a very difficult skill to master, even in our native language. And here we are asking the students in a second language, which, who are advanced learners, but still second language, we are asking them to write an academic paper. So um, I was thinking of different ways in which we could ease the students into the process of writing this type of genre. And I thought of collaborative writing. And let's think about that. Most of us work also with other colleagues. And we find, more often than not, that when we work with another person, we have more ideas, we brainstorm, we organize our essays much better than when we do it by ourselves. And I thought, well, let me explore how collaborative writing works in the language class. So collaborative writing involves two or more people working together to produce one <coughs> document, one writing document, in a situation in which a group takes responsibility for having produced the document. So we have two students, two or more students, working together in a final paper, or in a paper, several papers. Now, to enhance the collaboration, I had to look for different tools. And from all the tools that were available, I found two that were really appropriate for the purpose. They were wikis and the voice and written chats. The wikis are web pages that potentially anyone can edit. Uh, similar to a Word document, we can work on the wiki, it has the same features. But the difference and the benefit is that the wiki is always, the paper on the wiki is always up there. The students can just type the URL and go to the page and do the editing. And I'm going to show you an example now. Uh, and this, another benefit is that we can actually see, not only as instructors, but the students can also go back to the history of the document and see what changes have been made who made the changes and how often the changes were made. And we can actually go back to a previous draft that we like more and make the changes go back. Uh, this collaborative process is enhanced when we accompany it with the use of voice and written chats, which are a synchronous web voice, written, uh, voice or written applications. And the important part here is the synchronous, because we are actually helping our students to communicate with one another in real time. And they can brainstorm ideas, they can work on the thesis, they can work on the content, organization, structure, etc. And now I'm going to show you the tools. Now, I'm not endorsing any tool, but I'm going to show you what I did use. For the wiki, I use pbwiki.com which is free and you can just go and it's very easy to use. I look at several wikis, including the Black, a wiki in Blackboard, a Google Docs, a Media Wiki. And the reason why I chose PB Wiki is because it actually helped me understand the student's process, the writing process. So this is the wiki I created. And, oops. One of the things with the wikis is that they are still in their infancy. They are not sophisticated tools. All right. 
So this is the page I created. This was the introduction where I told them what we were going to do in the class and what they were going to work on. And for the class, I had several assignments. A few of them were individual and a few of them were collaborative. And there were two reasons to do this individual and collaborative work. One of them is that even though I believe that writing with another person is beneficial for the student, for the work and for the quality, students do not always feel comfortable working with another person. When we are working with someone else, somehow we are releasing control of what we are doing and we really need to trust the other person. And sometimes this can be an issue mainly when we are talking about grades. So to avoid that conflict, I had a few essays that were written individually and a few essays that were written in collaboration. I also believe that as instructors, we need to provide students the opportunity to learn in collaboration because as Elizabeth said, they are going out to work and they are not going to work by themselves. They are going to work with other people, they are going to work with other colleagues and they need to know how they can use different tools and how to behave in a collaborative environment. So let me show you the collaborative page I created for my students. So they went here, Escritura Colaborativa. Here I had the different groups, the different pairs, and I'm going to click on one of them. And you are going to see this is their essay, which was around 500 words. I'm sorry. This was the argumentative essay. This was an essay they have to write for the class. And it was about the role of men and women in Latin American society. I was also trying to connect the writing with the cultural component in the department. So this is the essay that they gave me at the end. But what I was really looking at was at the process. And to look at the process, I can go down to the history page, which is here. I click in history. And here I see all the drafts students work in while they were working on the essay. So you see here all the drafts. Actually, they wrote 68 drafts of that paper. And by draft, I mean they were adding things. It's not that they were just complete essays. They were reviewing what they were doing. Three of them might be more mine because I gave them feedback. But let me show you the difference between one draft and another one. So this is the, one I, the first one I did, which is blank. So then one of the students wrote, and I click here in compare, and you can actually see what the student wrote in green. Um, I can compare it to other drafts. And here I see how the student is making changes already. So for example, here we have social in red is cross because she made a change. And the change she made was to add a comma after social. And here we see that she added the word fuerte, the strong feeling. She changed it, changed it to strong, no, a feeling of superiority. She changed it to strong feeling of superiority. So she was adding changes, uh, commas, punctuation, grammar, etc. Mm -hmm. Let me show you another example. And I don't know what I'm going to find. Just um, one thing to keep in mind uh, about wiki, the terms get confused sometimes. Because you'll hear people say that anybody can delete. <clears throat> Typically, though, what they're saying is that you can delete something, but in a wiki, the idea of purging, completely removing any version or content is usually reserved for one person. Mm -hmm. It's important to keep that in mind. You know, if anybody can edit, it sounds like chaos. 
but with the history button, you can always have everything. And with the safeguard that, any, that only one person can purge, then everybody can be free to delete. It's just the use of the terms delete and purge. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. And usually the structure is the one who can purge. So here you see again how the person is making changes, adding the same. I'm going to show you how I gave them the feedback because it's important for the writing class. I gave them the, my feedback in the wiki. If I find it, my feedback, here. Okay. What I did, I didn't focus on every single thing, on, on every single error the students committed because there is no point. Research has shown us that it doesn't matter that we correct everything, they're not going to look at that. So what I do is focus just on a few aspects. And for example, you see V in parentheses, that meant verb. There was something wrong with the verb. It could be mode, tense, aspect, it could be reflexive, anything. Uh, when you see a voc, it could be vocabulary. Interrogation mark meant what do you mean here? And if you see there are some numbers, one, two, three, four, you see here, one, um, two. Those were the comments I was giving them regarding content, and I wrote them at the end. You can also write the comments by clicking on the comment function. I prefer to do that, last, I did that last semester. This semester I'm actually using the, con the comment function. But you get more or less an idea of how you can use the wiki. Now, to write on a wiki, uh, what you do is click on edit page. And when you click here, for example, if I add this, save, it's going to show later on what I did. And that's how the students can work together. All right, the other tool I used was the voice and the written chats. And to do that, I went to Wimba and to Blackboard and Wimba. Uh, the written chat is under communications. Go to group pages. I have the different groups here. Let me make this window smaller. collaboration, <coughs> go to recordings, and then you can see how the students actually got together several times to discuss the essay. And if I click on one of them, for example, you have here, they talk for one hour, 25 minutes, just discussing the essay the first time. They, they, they talk later on a second time and they were talking for two hours, 16 minutes. So they were working on the essay in the wikis, and they were also discussing content, the structure, organization, grammar, vocabulary in the wiki, in the chat. And let me show you just one example here. So here they are talking about the thesis, they are talking about the content. You can also see later on here how they are looking for some content. And here the content is in English because I told them they had to look for sources and their sources could be either in English or in Spanish. I didn't care about that. They have to write in Spanish though. So here they are just looking for some sources and they are sharing. And the beauty of using this type of uh, synchronous tools is that students can work from the comfort of their homes. So instead of uh, coming to school and getting together and say, oh, listen, this is what I found, they can just say, oh, look at this, I just found this on the web, or I found this, and write it or say it. Um, I'm going to show you an example of the vo voice direct. It's under docu doc documents. I created rooms for every single pair, and I'm going to show you the work of one of the pairs, which is going to be in Spanish, but you might get the idea, you will get the idea. So in order to talk, the students click in the hand, and they are talking, everything is recorded, and they stop by clicking here, and I hope I don't mess up. 
we can listen to the conversation by going to the archives. And the students can actually also go to the archives and listen to what they said. If they don't remember something, they can <coughs> go back. So let me show you an example. Okay. And I can listen to the whole conversation either one by one, one fragment by fragment, or I can listen to the whole conversation at once. If I click, I continuously play. So let's see. ¿Por qué piensas que el título tiene que ser um, la pregunta? The 10 seconds. <laughs> But you see, she's, uh, the first person is asking, what do you think should be the title? And then the other person thinks and gives the answer. But they are brainstorming, they are thinking, they are negotiating, which is something that doesn't usually happen when we work individually. We don't have much room to negotiate with ourselves. Um, and let me show you, those are the tools that we use. Let me show you how we use them in the class. Something that we need to take into account when we are using these tools is that we need to connect what we are doing with technology to what is happening in the classroom. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. So for each writing activity, we spend two weeks for each writing activity. Uh, we had the classes on Tuesday evenings from 4.30 to 7. So the first Tuesday in the class, we talk about the topic that we were going to discuss and talk about the organization and the structure of the genre. Then I gave them until Sunday to work in their pairs, in their wikis and the chats to complete the first draft. They had to do it and they could do it on their own time. And I had, I gave myself from Tuesday night, Sunday night to Tuesday to give them all the feedback to all the pairs. So I gave them the feedback for grammar, uh, structure, organization, context, syntax, vocabulary, etc. Then in class, the second week on Tuesday, I selected a few essays of people who were working by themselves. And we commented the essays on the content, the structure, the, the organization. And then we have general feedback for the whole class. And I gave them until the following Tuesday, a whole week, to complete the assignment, to give me the second draft. So how did the students use these tools? Um, when I started, I have used both tools, chats and wikis. When I worked with someone, with one of my colleagues, I used Skype. So I was very used to this type of uh, tools. But I didn't know how the students were going to use them. It was very interesting because more or less all the students use them in, the, in a very similar way. First of all, the students met in the chats and they talk about thesis, the topic, they even thought of a title, they look for supporting evidence and they thought of the organization. Sometimes they also divided the work. One said, we, you can work in the introduction, I will work in the conclusion and both of us work on the on the argumentation, on the different parts that we have to support. Um, later on, students work on the wikis, and they, use, they used to do that individually. Like one person met, uh, went, went to work on Wednesday morning, and the other person worked on Thursday evening. They work, they work a little bit on the coherence too, but they actually waited for my feedback, that, which I gave them from Tuesday to Monday, they waited for my feedback to really work on the coherence of the essay. Um, at that time, they went back to the chats and they focused on the ideas, they work with my feedback, they work more on the structure, and they did that everything together. And individually, in the wikis, they focus on very local aspects, such as grammar, indicative versus subjunctive, or preterite versus imperfect, or specific vocabulary. So the global aspects, they were treated as a group, 
but they focus on the local aspects individually. And this was more or less what happened. Um, they use the different tools for different purposes. If we look at the wikis, if we look here, they use both chats and wikis for content, and they use chats and wikis for organization in both cases. But in the wikis, they focus more on local aspects. We have the grammar, we have vocabulary, and editing. In the chats, we see that they negotiate, they brainstorm. The, when we talk about agreement, they were talking about, uh, it was agreement about this thesis. What are we going to say? How are we going to support this? Uh, they ask uh, for opinion to each other. I think we should do that. What do you think? And again, we had another negotiation there. They plan the task. They were very clear of this is what we have to do in the introduction. This is what we have to do in the two sides of the argumentation. This is what we need to write in the conclusion. Uh, they divided the work at this point, and then they went back together. Um, so when we use the collaborative writing using wikis and tools, we see that the students focus more on global issues than in local issues. Usually, when students work individually, they tend to focus more on local aspects. Let me change the verb. Let me change the agreement. Let me change the subject, uh, the specific word. However, in this case, they focus more on the content, on the meaning, and how we are going to structure it. And then they also focus on fluency and complexity. But it was a second thought. Um, with the wikis and the chats, students work much more on the style. They were much more focused on finding resources. They focus much more on the feedback I gave them. They discuss the feedback. Sometimes they didn't understand very well what I said, and they try to figure it out. When they are working by themselves, well, they don't really, if they don't understand, they just skip it. But they were forcing each other. Uh, it, the, the wikis and chats encourage the development and generation of ideas, uh, negotiating ideas and the planning of tasks. Now, I'm going to show you, since I have time, I'm going to show you the breakdown for each pair um, for the wikis and for the chats and students' opinions. Uh, using the chats, we, I had the five different pairs I, I examined here. All of them focus on content. Many of them, as that the last pair, focus on agreement. They really wanted to make sure that they were in tune with the other person and that they agree on what to write. Then we have some of them focus on sources. Organization was a big one. Asking for opinion, a structure, planning task, talking about the feedback, being polite. There was a pair who was very, very polite, extremely polite. No one to hurt each other's feelings, which is good. Um, when we use the wikis, I only look at three. Uh, they look at the content. But then we start to see how they look at the grammar and they look at the editing. An organization they did, but less, in less, to less extent. Now, what do the students think about the use of wikis and chats? Because that's important. Uh, I asked them at the, at the beginning of the semester, I gave them a questionnaire. And I gave them the same questionnaire at the end of the semester. And first of all, I asked them whether they thought the wiki, oops, sorry, the wiki would help them to improve their grammar. And I have two numbers. The first line is the beginning of the semester. The second line is at the end of the semester. So at the beginning of the semester, the students thought the, the wiki would help them to improve their grammar. 90% and 10% uh, thought that it really would help them. By the end of the semester, the wiki didn't actually help them that much. They were 50-50. Um, however, when we look at the content, at the beginning of the semester, we had 80% who thought it would help them. 10% thought, yeah, I'm not so sure it's going to help me. Actually, I don't think so. And 10% thought it would really help them. By the end of the semester, we see how the students actually thought it really helped them with the, with the content. When we look at uh, organization, 
at the beginning, 90% thought it would help them and 10% thought it would really help them. By the end of the semester, we had no so clear results. 20% uh, thought it didn't help them at all, 50% still had the same opinion, but 30% really thought it really helped them. Um, again, when we look at the chat, at the beginning of the semester, students were divided regarding the effectiveness of the chat for grammar. Um, by the end of the semester, students totally, th they thought that chats didn't help them with the grammar. However, in, for the content and for the organization, in both cases, students felt that using the chats actually helped them for content and organization, which makes sense based on what I said before. Students tend to focus on global aspects when they are using these tools, and they prefer to, do, to work by themselves to focus on the grammar. So it actually represents what I said before. And that's it. If you have any questions. Can they be in a voice board and on their wiki at the same time? They can be in both. They need to have different windows. But they can um, be in the voice board and they can be working on the, uh, on the wiki. And actually, there were people who were, who were doing both at the same time. And they were saying, let me change this. And they say, and do you say it? So they were doing both things at the same time. When you were talking about using um, PV Wiki, do you put that within Blackboard? Um, I tried to, but it didn't work well. What I actually did, I, invite, I created my Wiki. I invited all my students to the Wiki, and they signed up for the Wiki. OK, so it's just on, on the web? It's just on the web, yes. I tried to do that to have everything in one place. It didn't work. So, but it's, it was an easy transition. Why did you like PVWiki more than the ones that you have in Blackboard? Uh, I like the history. I like how when you look at the history of the PVWiki, you can see the changes. You can see the whole fragment. In, in Blackboard, they only show you one sentence. They only show you the sentence that they have changed. And for me, it was important to see the context yeah. Yeah. where they have changed it. Could you put up the website one more time? The PB Wiki? Yeah. One we use. Do you want the website? Oh, there are two lines, yeah. The slide or the? Yeah, the slide. Okay. Oh, the slide. Uh, my, my last question is to the gentleman I'm very much concerned about uh, faculty promotion and performance. I'd like to know how many administrators are in this country. I can't answer that. I don't know. The problem is that if they don't know what's going on, how will it affect the performance of my faculty? I, I, are, are you, do you work here at UNDC? No, no. Maybe we just catch up a little okay. bit later. Yeah. Because with all this, what I see her putting up and the amount of work involved, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how, in terms of promotion and all that. Uh, I, I see your question is, what credit goes to the instructor exactly. for this kind of effort? Exactly. I think that's a question all institutions have to be asked. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some aren't, some aren't. Okay. You know, um, I can tell you that we have faculty now who are um, using their Blackboard course sites. And I'm only using Blackboard. It can be PD Wiki. It can be any number of things. Um, they're asking those same questions about how they get evaluated. I know continuing professional studies, we have online instructors. You know, unfortunately, UBC doesn't have an online course evaluation tool. We have course we have course evaluations that are done online, but we don't have evaluations of online courses. It's a real challenge. Yeah. Are you? Uh, 
using a, a, a username login for the students to get into the wiki or is it publicly available? You need to have a password. Okay. You need, I need to invite you. This is the this graph <coughs> in the chats. We actually, when I look at the chats, I actually saw that only one pair talk about grammar. Is actually I, I analyze all the chats, and they were focusing more on the on the global aspects. So it's actually not only the perception. Now, learning from the experience from last semester, I still think they can talk about grammar, that they can use these, these tools to focus on grammar, which is an important component. Especially, it's a part, it's a part of their grade, right? Exactly. So now this semester, I have included that, and I'm telling them, you better talk about this, because I'm going to look for it. In other words, I don't think there's anything that precludes them improving their grammar through this process. I think this is no. work. No, no, no. It can be done. It can be done. But again, it's, we also have we are learning how to use these tools, and this is part of the learning process. Mm -hmm. um, just, just so you know, Anne and I were talking earlier. Duke University Center for Instructional Technology has been doing a three-year study of using audio as a revision feedback tool for peer editing. It's fascinating because what Anna is describing here uh, has been written up um, by the Center for Instructional Technology down there. When you think about it, students are not confident writers. So when you ask them to peer review one another, what are they going to do? They're going to mimic what they think that you do. And that is, you're going to pick them apart on grammar, punctuation, spell. That's what they do. But when, you, when you're speaking, you are forced to deal with bigger structure, conceptual items. That's probably a really valuable tool for you know, uh, non-confident writers so that they can get some experience with that. It's not to adopt the question, Alan, in terms of grammar, mechanics, and it's a um, I, I can see your point if you get to the language class. I yeah. mm -hmm. um, but if, for those that are not, who are working in English, I just reference what, what you can say. I also, I also would like to say I graded among grammar in the final product. I was not looking at it in the process. The process was for them to work on it, to work on the content and work on different aspects of the language. Um, I evaluated students both in the composition and in the use of the tools, mainly in the use of the chats, because I really wanted, I wanted to enhance the collaboration. And unfortunately, we know the grades are a big push to enhance anything. And I gave them a percentage of the grades was based on what they did in the chats, either written or void chats. I was not looking at when, if they wrote it, I was not looking at accuracy, I was not looking at grammar, I was only looking at the process, I was looking at the content. I really wanted to encourage the collaboration. And that was, at that point, it was everything that I care about. The product, that was up at the end. Uh, this was principally a face-to-face -face class that was enhanced with the online technology. Yes. Did you find a change the dynamics of the face-to-face -face experience with the students in the classroom? It did change the dynamics. Um, actually, I felt the class was much more connected. Um, they not, I'm going to say, not all the groups work the same. Some groups work perfectly well, some other pairs just don't work well. And we have that in real life. Some groups work well and some others don't. But I did feel that there was a sense of community that was created by the use of these tools. <coughs> and it transferred to the class. It was very clear, there was a very good environment. Um, even with the difficulties, sometimes they were telling me, oh, the voice chat is not working, uh, <coughs> I'm having problems. 
but still, there was a very positive, a good environment. It did trans translate. I was going to add to that. I actually uh, I teach uh, the same course on campus, both face to face and on a hybrid format. And what I'm finding is that the students that are in the hybrid class are much more interactive during the in-person meetings than the class that's just in person all the time. They do develop that sense of community. They ask many more questions and get much more engaged. I wonder if that has to do with the fact that the class doesn't end. In other words, it's continuing. Yeah. Yeah. With the online, it's ongoing and it's accessible. Right. But it can carries into the discussions even in person, which is fascinating. Now, as Elizabeth said, it's very demanding on the part of the structure because the class, the class doesn't end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question. Maybe Elisa might have something to say about this. How do you um, go about um, assigning groups? Do you um, pre-group them? At uh, the <laughs> beginning, I didn't know the students. So I just spared the students pretty much based on the order in the list. What I was very careful on pairing native speakers with native speakers because I had some native speakers. I also had heritage speakers, and then I had foreign language learners. I gave them, we had a month of training. What I did, I took the students to the language lab, and we discussed how to use the wikis, we discussed how to use the voice chats. We met once, and then, they work, we met again at the IMC to resolve some problems. And they talk a lot with John Costello, with some students had a few problems. It's very important to train the students. During that training period, you get to know them and you see their level. And then it's when you can make changes. And during that training period, I didn't give any grades. We work on everything in the class but I didn't give them grades for the assignments in the wiki or the chats because I didn't want to raise the anxiety. We need to be very careful with that. It's a new tool for them. They, they're anxious. Some of my students know how to use the tools. Some others, they don't. Uh, some students know how to use the tools outside of the class, but not for class purposes, which is a whole different setting. <laughs> and you need to train them. And you need to tell them, this is how I'm going to grade. This is what I am looking for. And you need to be very specific and consistent. There was someone else. Okay. Did you find that the quality of the collaborative writing was much higher than the quality of the individual writing? Yes, definitely. Um, the difference is that individual writers focus on the local aspects and the pairs focus on the local aspects, but on the, mm. on the whole. They discuss everything. The individual writers, they are just go to the point, she, the instructor told me this, I'm going to change this. Then they, they don't go any further than that. But the, in pairs, they revise the entire essay. There were two people thinking. It did, the quality was definitely much better. Well, I look actually at content, which was much better for the pairs. A structure was much better. Organization was much better. The only thing that was not significantly different was the grammar. And it's because the students who work individually, they focus on grammar. But for the rest, it was much better in the pairs. Any resentment that uh, they, the that they feel that you're asking them to do more? Uh, there are some students who are resentful and they're like, what do I have to do this week, I think? Uh, <laughs> it happened. But I think this is also a matter of what we do as institution. If there is only one person who is working with hybrid courses or is working with voice direct or is working with wikis, that person is going to be the crazy professor who is doing these weird things. But if we establish a curriculum that is articulated in which we are using different tools for different purposes, 
and direct it to what we want to achieve, the educational goal we want to achieve, then it will be different. The interesting thing is that I had one student who said, you know, this wiki thing didn't work for me. But at the same time, this student told me that she had a bad partner. And she understood the benefits if she had had a better partner. She told me that after the class, once her bad feelings were gone. But yes, it's not easy. Implement this type of tools is not easy. You're going to find challenges, mainly from the non-traditional students. And some students don't have computers, and we need to understand that. And sometimes we don't. Hi, uh, my name is Shadia Avers, and I'm from Goucher College. Uh, I am going to give you the perspective of program. Best, can you hear me? No? Should I shout? OK. <laughs> I am going to give you the perspective of best practices in online and blended learning or hybrid uh, for programs not specific courses. And I'll give you a big a, uh, rundown of what we're doing. Uh, so at first, we're going to talk a little bit about best practices, then how they apply to Goucher College, an overview of the tools we use, and if we have time, a demo. Um, the best practices, uh, I was first, uh, I first came to uh, the distance learning. I'm the director of uh, distance learning at Goucher. When I first came to the job, uh, they already had three established masters that are totally online. And uh, they didn't have any best practices. They didn't have any guidelines. They were just putting things online. And it was a big task to redo everything. So we started with creating best practices, a strategic plan for distance learning, and a uh, uh, rubrics, definitely rubrics. So what we started with was the distance learning best practices. And we, we based them on best practices out in the field. And we added to them the best practices from my own research. That was my dissertation. So uh, what we mainly worry about in online courses is creating commu community through collaborative learning and how to address different learning styles in the online environment or even the hybrid environment. And we needed to also match the tools and the, uh, the content with the learning outcomes, not just use technology for technology's sake. Like Anna demonstrated, there was a definite learning outcome in her, in her teaching. Uh, then we needed to worry about how do we keep these students engaged? Because it's not very easy to keep them engaged if I'm only presenting text to them. Then uh, we needed to create training programs, mentoring programs, and put services in place. Um, the training program was the first one we created was for faculty training. And the training program was directed on, for them, on how to, uh, how to use the technology, but specifically on how to teach online. And uh, help them with designing their own courses. Very few, I can honestly tell you, very few completed the program. They did not have the time to, to do the work, to do the complete training. It was a lot of work. So the last idea was we came up with a course design team. And the course design team uh, has several people on board, mainly myself, several technology specialists, and an instructional designer. And she's here. <laughs> So our, uh, and we meet with the faculty and program directors. The faculty member gives us the content, and we design the course for online delivery for them with their input. We are very, very, very careful not to create cookie cutter courses, which means each course has to address faculty needs and faculty teaching style. And, uh, but, we do strive for consistency within programs. 
which means if I am in the Masters of Education, there should be consistency in how I present my material to the students. So if I c call my, the area where I put the assignments, learning units, then it should be called learning units for everybody. Otherwise, the student, if they're ta taking more than one course, every time they go inside the course, they have to relearn, well, where did she put this? Mm -hmm. So it has to be very consistent for them. Uh, then after we design, and we design the activities for them, we look for learning objects, and learning objects are, could be video clips, could be anything that create exercises for them. And uh, we have a specific layout for, uh, for courses. Uh, we start with, a with the readings and a lecture. They always have to have a lecture. Then we go on to activities, and we always have to have a discussion. Now, we do have the wikis. We do have the, um, the uh, tools that you have here at UMBC. I think you have learning objects, which includes a journal, a blog, and a wiki. Uh, it also it includes an expo piece, which is, could be e-portfolios. Uh, we also have the Wimba tools, most of them except that one piece, the Genie, Course Genie. And uh, we keep adding tools. Now, the only thing I have to say about the wiki that is inside Blackboard, it does history, but like Anna said, it presents the history in chunks, which means you as a professor have to put it together. But then you can see the final product and it's not very pretty. The PB Wiki is prettier. But the advantage of the Blackboard Wiki, it's inside Blackboard, they don't have to sign in. They just go directly to it. That was one advantage that we, we liked about it. Um, what we did at first also, so after training the teachers, so everything has to be done before the course is to be delivered. And it has to be approved at least four weeks before course delivery, which means the instructor is being asked to design this course a semester ahead of time. But once they start teaching, we give them a mentor. And that mentor stays with them for as long as they need. Minimum is one semester. We have one teacher who has requested a mentor for the fourth semester. She feels more at ease if somebody is there helping her. With the students, all new students, since these are online programs, all new students have to be trained on the use of tools. What we do is, once we get the new list of students, I enroll them into a, a training course, and I will show you the demo at the end. And the training course is designed for programs. So let's say in the e MED, they don't use the live classroom, I remove it from the training. If they use the live classroom, I put it in the training. If they use the wiki tool, now if I have several teachers using different things in one program, I include all the tools and say, train on these basic ones and go back and do the specific ones if your instructor in, is using it because it's a lot of tools. And if they don't use them right away, they're going to forget. So we do that. And uh, with the blended courses, we haven't trained them ahead of time because that becomes too much. It's too many people to train. What I do with the blended courses, and I'll show you an example, is I include a tips and tutorials button in each Blackboard course. And in the tips and uh, tutorials, they have all the tutorials needed for them. And they can refer the students back. Well, before we start this unit, I would like you to go and learn how to use the Wiki, and they'll do that. So um, this is uh, an overview. The programs, what we have so far are three programs that are totally online, and they're, they're called limited residency programs, which means these students meet two weeks a summer on campus. The rest of the time, they are online. But we are still concerned with creating community. Uh, the education program is currently putting all their courses online 
but then they're not abandoning the face-to-face. -face. We're converting all the face-to-face -to, -face to blended mode or hybrid um, for several reasons. Uh, these are all graduate programs. The undergraduates, we haven't done much because they're not much interested and they use Blackboard for just to put syllabi and to put documents. Um, in my opinion, distance learning works very well for adult learners. For the undergraduate, it's still skeptical, but the future of instruction is going to be in the blended mode. It does improve instruction, it does improve uh, retaining of information, and it does make them feel more like a community. Even though it, you say it's hanging over your head 24-7 because, because the class never ends, uh, there are tools. We tell the teachers that you have to really learn how to manage your time, and part of knowing how to teach online is managing your time because if it hangs over you, you 24 7 it's not pleasant anymore so uh, and in each course we create also an expectation piece and the expectation piece and that's required the netiquette the expectation and the tools are required in all the courses in the expectation piece i made them put there what do you expect of me as a teacher and I list it. What I expect of you as a student, and I list it. In the teacher expectation, I will list very specifically. I will respond to all your emails within 24 hours. I will give <coughs> feedback on all assignments, graded or not graded, within. And I am going to disagree on one tiny piece. With the discussion board, I tell them, do not interfere too much because it will halt the discussion. Once you start interfering and responding to each student, they will stop talking to each other and they will start responding to you, not. So if you want conversation, you have to step back, read, but tell them in the expectations that you're reading and then give them feedback every now and then, not individual feedback, feedback for the class. Individual feedback should be done privately because then they start wondering, well, if she responded to so-and-so and didn't respond to me means I didn't do a good job. So you have to be careful there. Uh, the, we have also future programs and everything at Goucher from now on is going to be online. They tell me it has something to do with the Carnegie classification, but now, what do we have? What tools we have? We use like, like uh, UMBC. We have Blackboard. We have uh, many building blocks. Uh, the Wimba tools are one of the building blocks and the learning objects with the wikis and blogs are another building block. We've had Wimba for, from before it was Wimba. It was used to be called Horizon Live when it was first, uh, first came on board and it just had the live classroom and it used to be a standalone tool, so we started using it because before that, they were using the phone to deliver instruction. Um, so uh, what we do is, from now, uh, this is just a uh, Goucher policy. They don't go for uh, open source. It has to be approved by the college, it has to be bought by the college, and it has to be a building block in Blackboard. Now, it makes sense because you need a portal. You need things to be in one place. You don't want the students to be hunting and going from place to place to find where to participate. Uh, this is why when we're building the courses, we build learning units. And this is a feature in Blackboard. When you build a learning unit, it creates a slideshow for them. And within the slideshow, we link everything. If there is a handout, it's there. If there is a discussion, it's there. So I don't want you to get out of your unit to look for something else. I'm leading you from piece to piece to piece to your final product. Um, the Wimba tools that are most commonly used is the live class. We have also voice boards. Voice Direct, we had some problems with it at the beginning. It seems to be working now. 
but it used to kick you out if two people pressed exit at the same time and it would stop. Now it seems to be okay. Voice boards I like. The voice boards, uh, she showed you, uh, Elissa showed you the live class, so I will talk about the voice board. The voice board is a discussion board with an audio piece to it. And I have several teachers using this when you need to practice phonetics especially for uh, lower school teachers, how to teach the students. So you post your, uh, uh, you uh, record your post, and you can add a, also a um, text piece to it, and then you can respond in audio, and you can respond in text, so, and then back and forth. I have a teacher who used it for group activity as well. Um, voice email is great. Uh, because when you send them emails about things that are happening, especially private emails, well, how did you do on this assignment? If it's oral, it lessens the threat of, well, you didn't do so well. <laughs> so, and many teachers like the voice annou announcement piece. When you put the vo voice announcement, it's they have to click, and when they come in, and today you have to do X, Y, and Z. We designed the courses not on a weekly basis. They're designed into unit chunks. And each unit could take a week. It could take four weeks. <coughs> but as long as that unit is contained into a beginning, an end, and a learning outcome being demonstrated, then they've done their job. Uh, we create lectures, um, not that the students cannot read, but some students need to hear. And if you want to address many learning styles, lectures are great. Now, lectures cannot be more than, I have a person who really talks, so that's like 20 minutes. 20 minutes is a lot. Between 10 to 15 minutes is great. They can be smaller chunks. If they're too long, then we cut them in little pieces and follow them by activities each time. Uh, to, uh, to create lectures, we're using several things. We use PowerPoint, and you can uh, add audio to the PowerPoint, and you can uh, compress it. And uh, the, <coughs> the final product looks like a flash movie where you see the, uh, the PowerPoint in front of you, they see the points, so they have the mental hooks of the text itself and you talking over the text, and it proceeds by itself. You don't have to click or do anything. So that's one piece. We, can also, we also use Captivate to create the lectures. If we create it for them, we use Captivate. We haven't bought Captivate for instructors. We did for Empatica for them. But another one, some of them like to use the webcam, but with the webcam, all they're seeing is your face. Uh, how long can they look at you and just listen? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, they need something written down for them. And usually we include the lecture, the PowerPoint without audio as a PowerPoint there for them to print as a handout and take notes while listening to the lecture. But another piece you can use for doing lectures, and many of our faculty use it, is the live class. So you can go in there and record. It's a, it's a waste of time and space to use it for lectures. But what I tell them is the live class is uh, a great tool to explain things on the spot and to create community. And once you archive, in itself, it becomes a lecture because then they can come back and see the PowerPoint there and see, uh, hear you talking, and they can even hear the interaction with the students. So it adds the face-to-face -face inter uh, interaction. Um, uh, the learning units, oh, I, the, uh, we, we use synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, we have to balance it. Why do we use, uh, why do we balance, depending on program, in the, uh, in the ED program, if I tell them, you have a live class once a week, I will have a riot. If we have more than three a semester, they complain. Mostly because they say, well, I signed up for this class because it's distance learning and you're making me be at a specific time 
to, so what we do is each instructor has to tell us ahead of time, I'm going to have five live cl uh, class sessions or three, and it has to be in the class description, otherwise they cannot have any. Now they can have many that are not required. Then if they come, they come, and you archive, and whoever didn't come can go and listen to it. Mm -hmm. I can. Well, no, it could be both. Um, the, probably it's a misconception because the first thing we have to explain to them when they far, first come to the online classes, these are not training modules. These are not independently created CDs, DVDs, or WBTs where you can go and do the work whenever you want at whatever time you want because it's a misconception. They come to you and think, well, I thought I could, I have the whole semester to finish. No. You are participating every day. If you don't log in every day, you missed quite a bit. And then part of the synchronous piece is, well, you're making me come at a specific time and I'm very busy. So we have to announce it ahead of time. Now, in the Master of Arts, they have a synchronous class once a week. And if you take it away from them, they get upset. They like the piece because they, this is where they go and converse and talk to each other. But removing the live class altogether isn't advisable because it's a great tool to explain things on the spot, to create community, and to, um, to connect with people. Uh, so this is the advantages of synchronous. What is the advantages? Uh, the advantages of asynchronous is reflection. With the synchronous piece, even if you give them 10 seconds, you're still not getting deep enough reflections, but you will in the discussion board. Uh, now, the only thing I also explained to them is, what is the difference between a discussion board, a wiki, a blog, and a journal? And they're not interchangeable. Um, a blog can only be used for reflection, but it's a reflection where everybody is reading, but you're not required to respond. You can, but you don't have to. A journal, only you and the teacher can see it. It's still a reflection. A wiki cannot replace the discussion board because you're not really discussing. You are working towards a final product that you are going to give to the teacher. Um, do I have time to show them? Five minutes? It might be longer just to log in. the Blackboard tutorial course uh, for students. And in it, when they first come in, they see the directions. And my screen is how to access the units, what they need to do, and what's a learning unit. Then they have the uh, staff information, then the tutorials themselves. So I cut them into the Blackboard pieces, then the building blocks separately. This way, if a teacher is using one set or the other, I can tell them to go one way or the other. Succeeding online is te teaching them tips on how to manage your time and how to be a successful online student. And the rest are tech requirements for uh, Goucher. Now, if you do not have these requirements, you cannot take an online or a hybrid class. You need this or you will not succeed. And it's posted on the website. It's even in their catalog. And um, we design things here. I'm going to show you. 
So this is one of the learning units. They go in, I have a PDF for them, and the PDF tells them we are, we're, we're almost done with Captivate files, so we're going to put PDF and Captivate and you do what you please. But the PDFs are That is slow. And I thought John said, you're never slow on campus. OK, <laughs> here we say. You don't work here anymore. Not <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Actually, it's worth, worth at uh, Goucher. Uh, here, uh, it's picture directions. And it's step by step. How does this tool work? So how do you log into Blackboard? Where you find your course? Where does it take you? Where should you click? And we have, um, like the live class, we had to do six of these modules for the live class because if we do one, it's like 60 pages. So we cut them in chunks and we labeled them live class uploading products, live class managing, live class. And then we have a set for the students and a set for the teachers because they are very different. Now, once they finish this one, they proceed to the next slide. Either I have a test for them, assessment on how to use the tool and whether they retained it, or it could be also a, uh, a uh, how to apply it. And then they can apply it in this course. Uh, No, it's not working. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you're right. No, no. The tab? I did. Oh. Glasses. I can't see it. Oh, here. <laughs> uh, the, uh, once. You're right, it did open a new net tab. Um, then this is the netiquette that we are required, and this is troubleshooting. Before you call us, do the following. So what they do is you need to allow cookies. And if you have several browsers, follow different browsers how to allow cookies or how to clear cookies because sometimes it stops working. And then enable pop-ups for these three browsers. And how to install Java. Quick time, then technical support, then call Wimba if it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so um, would you like to see anything else? Any questions? You made a statement that uh, most of the faculty didn't complete the uh, introductory training for business learning. Uh, did you make that requirement of it's separate. They did not complete it when it was complete distance learning training, which means they had to design their own courses, but I taught them how. Uh, when we went to the course design team, since we're designing the course, they are completing the course on how to teach online. We do not have certification, and it's not mandatory. We cannot do that. Not yet. <laughs> uh, you made another statement that, um, that uh, adult learners are more receptive to distance learning or hybrid courses. Uh, do you have anything to back that up? And, and how do you define an, an adult learner? Well, this is it. Yes. Uh, the research has so shown, if you go to the Pew Network and look at their uh, surveys, adult learners are more, uh, more inclined <coughs> to do distance learning than uh, undergraduates. Now, what's the definition of an adult learner? You, we would think it's 18 and up. They're defining it, it's average age 35 and 30 and up. Or the younger ones are, even though they're adults, they're not putting them in that category. I have two questions about your mentoring program. You mentioned that once the course is developed, you have mentors that work with the faculty. Can you tell me if that's the resource, is it very resource intensive to do that? That's one question. The other one is, 
is there some type of feedback mechanism from the mentors back to the instructional designers about things that Yes, because the mentors are part of the instructional design team. So we have several technology specialists and what, or what you might call course developers. And these people are the ones that are mentors at this point and they report back. Now for feedback, we do not rely on them for feedback. We ask the instructors, we have a survey that we give them. They survey the students mid-semester and end-semester for feedback on how it worked, what should be changed, and we change accordingly. We redesign the course according to that feedback. You will eventually, and I'm hoping the instructors themselves will become mentors once they become proficient in teaching. Another question. I just wanted to let my colleagues know that uh, uh, the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs of UMBC has been sitting here since morning until we just left. He was curious. He wanted me to know that yes, he, that uh, UMBC was well represented and that they, that they know what is going on and if it comes when they do the faculty evaluation. So I was impressed that the UMBC, our host, was doing a good job. Thank you. I got, actually, I got my BA, BS in biochemistry and modern languages and linguistics from UMBC. I got a master's degree in French literature from College Park and a PhD in the LLC program at UMBC. <laughs> <laughs> and I came back. <laughs> uh, can I ask you a question about what, what is the attitude of the administration at Goucher to um, uh, distance learning and uh, what's the attitude of the administration at Goucher to distance learning? Uh, what's the attitude of the administration at Goucher to distance learning? Where are they? For graduate or undergraduate? Uh, undergraduate and graduate. For undergraduate, nothing is being done. It's nothing just, no, they are just pushing towards now start using Blackboard, start using the technology. For graduate, the push is for all online and the MED, MAT to be online and blended. <coughs> and uh, now the only problem with all of this is this is a recommendation and none of it is backed by you have to, or it's mandatory. The president, the president comes from, uh, from yes, he used to be the president of NPR. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. I was just interested in uh, uh, at Goucher College the, uh, the distinction between blended and hybrid. I mean, a little hybrid. I think hybrid is blended. It's well, just well, you're another. Using an <laughs> yes. It's synonymous. Yes. Okay. It's like. When you start talking distance learning, uh, uh, distance education, online learning, and e-learning, they all mean the same thing. Hybrid and blended mean the same thing. Okay, fine. Now, the, I guess people like to change to, well, this is a the designer term, blended. Well, it seemed like at one time the terminology was blended, and then I kind of moved away to, to hybrid. hybrid. And I now it's both. making a distinction. So uh, so. Actually, the Sloan is using blended now. Okay. I'm at the University of Baltimore, yeah. and we use blended for anything that's kind of in between, in that gray area, from like 20% okay. online to 80% so, so, online. Some combination. But the magic number we use for hybrid is the 50-50 mark, so that we can take advantage of scheduling a classroom twice. That's it, that's distinction. At, at the Sloan C, I went to their uh, blended learning workshop last year, and uh, they said they haven't made that distinction yet, and for them, blended or hybrid is determined by institution. Okay. So you can call it hybrid if you put 20% online or half-half, but it's institutionally defined at this point, which we want around. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, the graduate faculty are all adjunct because they are required to be uh, 
practitioners in their own field. So you have to be somebody with connections and with knowledge in your own area because this is what the students are looking for. Thank you, Chad. So again, thank you uh, everyone for coming. Again, uh, thanks to the folks at uh, UMBC for having us here. I'm um, just going to spend just a, if you don't know already, I'm Mark Devenor. I worked for Wimba for just about five years. And it's, uh, it's very interesting to see uh, the uptake of this technology uh, in the different areas that it's been happening as well. So uh, again, we're just going to take about 10 minutes here. I'm just going to give a brief wrap up, a brief summary of the Wimba solutions for online learning. And um, when I say online, I don't mean just distance learning. I mean, you know, hybrid courses, blended learning, any learning that takes place with a computer and uh, an internet connection, if you will. Um, I'm going to give an introduction of the latest addition to the Wimba tools, uh, which is Wimba Pronto. And I think this is going to go a long way. Um, and I think what we found today talking about, you know, the adult learners uptake of this technology has been, um, you know, faster than, um, than it has been with the, with the younger students. Uh, even though in, I think in a lot of cases, the younger students are more technically savvy. And uh, I think this is a tool that will actually help uh, break that log jam up. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Wimba Quick Start program, and uh, we can take Q&A uh, at any time. Again, we're at 20 after, so I'll try to wrap this up by, uh, by uh, 12.30. So uh, at Wimba, we believe that technology doesn't teach people. People teach people. We use technology, technology to facilitate that learning. But uh, again, the focus isn't just on the technology itself. And so uh, for, for uh, those of you who are not familiar with the Wimba tool set, uh, we have a number of different tools. They're not all listed here. Uh, but the three I'm going to talk about today, uh, the Wimba Classroom, uh, which had been talked about uh, in detail today. It's a tool which is used for synchronous teaching and learning. So anything that you need to do online where you think that the, uh, the ability for people to talk with each other, to show each other what they're talking about, this is where the Wimba Classroom comes into play. And all these tools integrate into a course management system, as Chadi was brought up, there has to be a platform, a portal for people to go to. Uh, the second tool set is the Wimba uh, voice tools, and these are designed uh, for asynchronous, asynchronous teaching and learning using the human voice. So uh, think of podcasting, you know, audio lectures, uh, but I think the most valuable um, component of the Wimba voice tools is in the area of language learning, because it's impossible to learn a language in a traditional course management system because it's text-based and asynchronous. And people need to be able to uh, listen to language and then have an opportunity to reply back to language as well. And then last but not least, uh, uh, Wimba Pronto. And many of you are probably not familiar with this tool, um, uh, even if you are familiar with the other tool. And what this is is a school-centric, an institutional instant messenger with your school's online community already built into it. And uh, there's going, to, there's going to be a lot of interesting things that are going to happen with this tool, but the neat thing about this is this is going to be a student-driven adoption of technology as opposed to school saying, here's this piece of technology, we're going to use it, teachers go expose it to the students. I think this one's going to work the other direction. So, so again, uh, Wimba Classroom we talked about today, what people use this tool for, they're using it for live virtual classes obviously, but there's all different types of things you can do in blended and hybrid courses from course capturing, um, you know, online office hours as you brought up, uh, guest lecturers, so even if you have a physical classroom, you want to bring in somebody at a distance, you could do so. Um, you know, students can use it for uh, study groups, collaborative workspaces. Um, you know, oftentimes when you have an online program, you need to be able to communicate with people um, to explain to them what the program is about. Um, so online student orientation, uh, this tool I've seen used for an awful, uh, in an awful lot of places. Um, and then also faculty members need to be trained on how to teach online. And so I see uh, uh, organizations use it to teach their, their faculty at a distance as well. So I'm not going to go into all the features and subsets, but you know, additionally, uh, what this tool is, it's a, it's a tool that you can use to break down geography or uh, distance. Um, and so it really doesn't matter where people are. Uh, we, and there's three things that I think that any platform has to have. The first thing is a good way for me to talk with you and you to talk back with me. So we have that with the, um, with the voice over IP that's built into the uh, Wimba classroom. Uh, the second thing that I think is really important is for 
you to be able to, uh, not only for us to communicate with each other using our voices, but to be able to, to share with each other what we're talking about visually. So you can do that with application sharing, um, you know, with uh, the electronic whiteboard, PowerPoints, any type of um, um, visual content that we want to bring into play. But um, the thing that I think is really important about using any type of tool uh, that's a, a synchronous uh, distance learning platform is the level of interactivity. You have to have it. It can't just be a passive experience like watching television. So the way we do that is through the use of breakout rooms or you know, even little things like emoticons, public and private chat, um, polling and quizzing, making sure that your you know, students just can't sit there for an hour or two hours and look at a screen. So you have to make these, uh, these events interactive. So the next tool set that we're going to talk about uh, briefly is the, the Wimbo voice tools. And what these tools are used for is to really add that human touch. Um, somebody had brought up the, the use of the, uh, sending uh, the voice email. And it's, again, it's not something that you have to overuse, but it's something that really adds that personal touch to your course. Um, it, uh, you can use these tools to appeal to different learning styles. Obviously, not everyone is uh, just a visual learner, and audio has its, pl has its part. Uh, I've heard it come up uh, at least three times about the, the ability to build community when students can actually talk with each other. And, uh, but again, the biggest thing that this, uh, the Wimba voice tools are gonna help your institution do is to add language instruction to your online courses. So if you want to put your online courses uh, online where people can take them at a distance, or if you want to facilitate um, you know, the, your face-to-face -face courses and supplement them where um, you know, a student can actually go ahead and practice something before they get to a class. Uh, it really lowers the anxiety that they have um, when they actually get to a physical classroom. They've actually practiced already. They can re-record. They can do it as many times as they want to. And then when they get to a physical classroom, they're much more prepared. <clears throat> so there's a number of different tools here. Uh, there's a podcasting tool, a uh, voice discussion board, which is probably the most used tool because of the fact that students can not only listen to audio and, and read text, but they have an opportunity to respond back with it using their own voice and they can practice. Uh, but there's a voice authoring tool, um, voice presentation tool, voice email, and of course uh, the tool is integrated in your course management system. So the tool I want to talk about today uh, is Wimba Pronto. And so we talked a little bit uh, earlier about Wimbo Pronto being an institutional instant messenger. So, I mean, what does this tool, what is it, what is it, what is it, how is it going to help your organization? How is it going to help your students? Well, it's a tool that's designed to promote that student to student learning that you guys are using some of the other tools for. Um, it's designed to promote that academic networking as well, so it, it can actually tie in the different components of your school so that they can actually talk to each other. And, uh, you guys can share with each other as well. Uh, to cultivate that campus community and also to provide quality services online. A lot of times in the distance ed courses, those students don't get the same level of services that your students that come to a physical location get. And I think Prano is uh, going to be a tool that's going to help fix that problem. So what is Prano? So Prano is a school-centric instant messaging platform. and uh, it goes beyond that. It has other components in it, like voice over IP. So not only will, will I be able to chat with you, if you have a microphone on your computer, I'll be able to talk, talk with you, using the same voice over IP we have in the Wimba classroom. Uh, and you can also have group voice and instant messaging as well. So if you, have, you want to uh, create uh, uh, four or five students and say, hey, you guys need to work on this project together, they will. Or they'll have the ability to do it spontaneously. Um, it also has video in it if you have a camera, and application sharing, which is very important. So if, if we're talking about a, a, a subject, working on a project, I can actually share my desktop. I can bring in a Word document or bring in an Excel spreadsheet, and we can then talk about that instant message, bring that application into that chat room environment. Now, the neat thing about Pronto is the fact that it's tightly integrated into your, into your course management system. So if a student is enrolled, just say in one course, say they're enrolled in Western Civ, the only other students that student is going to see in their instant messaging client is just the students that are enrolled in that course. Now, if they're taking five classes, they'll see all the students they're taking courses or uh, taking classes with. So they'll automatically be able to communicate with that person any time. Um, there's also a school tab in there. We'll get in there a little bit differently or uh, a little in a, in a couple minutes. But um, 
you know, one of the things that's a challenge about teaching online courses is that, you know, sometimes it feels like you're teaching it 24 hours a day, right? And so, oh, why do I need this tool? Now I'm going to be contacted all the time, right? So, but teachers and TAs can be invisible if they want to, and then they can use this tool to actually uh, facilitate some of those things like uh, office hours in um, a little bit easier way. And think of this tool as a, more of an informal communication tool, and the Wimba Classroom more is that formal environment. Okay, so the way that um, faculty members, staff, things of that nature, they can communicate with students using just the regular instant messaging platform, but there's a queued chat functionality that's built into it. So students, so say you're teaching an online course and you want to have an office hour on Monday from 8 o'clock till 9 o'clock. It's in the syllabus, I'm going to be available. Basically, you have a queued chat environment where your students can actually line up outside of your door and you can decide, hey, I want to talk to Mike. You can even ask him, to, hey, Mike, before you enter the room, tell me what your question is. And you can type out his question, then you can bring him into that QChat environment. You can chat with him back and forth privately. If he still doesn't get it, there's a voice over IP component. You click on this and he can talk to you and you can talk to him. Right? If you want to show your video like you're used to in your class now, you guys can see each other. Okay? But you're still having an issue and you say, Mike, I, I don't know what's going on. Can, can I see your, let me see the paper you're working on. You click on this application sharing button, you'll be able to see his desktop or any application that he's sharing with you. So you'll be able to say, hey, Mike, this is a great paragraph, but we need to change the topic sentence. And you could actually take control of his mouse and help him with that. But think of the applications for like tutoring, help desk. I just read um, a study that says it takes uh, 39 uh, minutes to uh, fix a help desk uh, a technical problem with a student when you have them on the phone. Now imagine if you had them talking with them voice over IP, and the help desk person can just say, hey, let me see your desktop. And they can just go in there and fix that problem. Um, library support. Um, I mean, really, any component to the bursar's office, any uh, admissions, any component of your school, if you want to, you could plug in by using this piece of technology. Now, the neat thing about this is it talks to your course management system, but it can be on whether you're logged into the course management system or not. So it's different than who's online with the old WebCT tool. I don't, you, some of you guys might be familiar with it. It's an application that sits separate, but it's, it's integrated into your course management system. So if a student dropped out of your, uh, you know, your Spanish 101 course, you wouldn't see them in, inside of Prano anymore. Yeah, so there, there's a context tab that's here. And so if someone's in your class, they have to be in your class at least, one, at least once. And then, once. and then you can keep that relationship going like throughout your educational experience if you put them into the context tab. But if, you, if, if somebody's in a course that you've never been enrolled in, you, you can't add them to your, to your buddy list. You're, you're, it's sort of a gated community around that community, that particular class. So can I build collaboration with my colleagues? Because they won't be in the class. Yes, you can. And so there's a school tab that's different, that's oh. broken out differently. Yeah. So the idea behind this tool, again, this is more than just an instant messaging platform. You're going to be able to add your school's community to it. Uh, it's ideal for student to student learning. They can just talk with each other. If they see each other online by that green icon, they'll be able to talk to that person. You know, how many times in, a, in an online learning course, if you just could talk to somebody for 30 seconds to get beyond that thing that's holding you up, you'd be able to go on and finish the project. Um, and I think it's going to be great for that. Informal stu study groups, tutoring, you know, obvious applications for online office hours, help desk support, student services. Um, last one is institutional notifications. I just saw two studies that basically said that the, uh, the text-based uh, instant, instant, er, institutional no notifications, um, they don't work when there's an emergency because the first thing that happens in an emergency is everyone picks up their cell phone and they start dialing back and forth and it shuts down. The messages eventually get out, but they, they set up a parameter saying 10 minutes. And so uh, what they're finding is that's not, the first thing that goes down is, the, is, the, is the, um, your cell phone uh, use. And so this is just one part. If you want to send out an institutional message to everybody in the school, you'd have the ability to do that. You know, there's a snowstorm, school's closed, or you know, don't, don't forget to go to the football game. You don't have the ability to do that. Question? Yeah, go ahead. I'm in the courses. You teaching a semester? I'm not teaching any classes. 
<laughs> That's why I love coming here to listen so to what, you guys because I get to hear. Why I'm asking this is from what I've heard uh, those who have presented this month as a faculty administrator, I, I'm wondering if, because in our school, some in the liberal arts have four courses to teach. In engineering and business, three courses. I think it's too much. And does administration, you, since you are a director, how do you go to administrate the administrators and say, how do we compensate the faculty? Yeah, I mean, that's not a question for me. Yeah, that's Mark, uh, yeah. Mark works for Wimba. Oh, yeah. oh. Yeah. Yeah. He's a good teacher, though. <laughs> Asking but these are, I mean, these, that's a very relevant question. I, I, I'm just not qualified to answer. Oh, yeah. You just say, compensate them well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just computer to computer right now. Uh, there is talk of going it, uh, taking Prano out to to the smaller devices, but this is, we've just released this technology as a, as a, you know. And is it something you're selling as an additional feature, like, or is it, you're not, you're not giving that, right? that Okay, so there's two versions of Prano. There's a basic version of Prano, which is free. We want to encourage any school who's interested in using Pronto to, to download the free version uh, and, uh, and use it. Uh, and then there's a, um, there's a production version of Pronto, which is for, for cost. The basic version is a little bit more scaled down. It has voice over IP in it. It has instant messaging. It talks to your course management system, but it doesn't have application sharing. There's no video. There's no queued chat. Oh. There's no inst uh, institutional not notification. It's more of a scaled down version. Uh, but to get familiar with the technology, the basic version is probably the best place to start. And Alan, we do have it. It's in our backboard. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's so many schools that have it. Uh, but the weird thing is, until you get this technology in the hands of students, this is when it, you're going to see it spread. Uh, there's so many schools that I work with have, have it installed in their Blackboard environment. But unless you get the students downloading it, uh, you know, it's just another ornament on the Christmas tree. I actually used it one, one winter, in which I taught a class, a three or four week course. And I told them, well, we have this new tool, Pronto. I know you can work with it. I don't really know very well what it does, but we can try and see what happens. And actually, the students use it to communicate with one another. Not, it didn't go from that class, but and that's, that's, at that moment, yeah. it worked. And that's, again, this, as opposed to technology coming from the top down, this is a technology that if you make it available, will come from the bottom yeah, up. I didn't do much with this. They, they actually told me, oh, we have talk in front of. We have discussed this. We have done this. So how many schools here are, how many people here are from a school with a FTE of around 4,000 or smaller? Couple. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We actually uh, we, we're putting together some packages of um, a quick start offer, and it, it's a it's it's a combination of Wimba Prano and Wimba Classroom, or Wimba Prano and the Wimba Voice Tools, and it's designed for schools uh, of approximately you know 4,000 or smaller. And basically, what comes with the offer? CMS integration, uh, ASP hosting, we host the technology for you. Two days of custom online training, plus weekly public training, 24-7 tech support, uh, FTE service levels, so Wimba Classroom, Wimba Voice, and Pronto. And the packages are starting around, as the top one's around 23,000. The lowest one's around 14,000. Uh, first package. So if any, anybody comes from a small school or you have a small online program um, and with the lower FTEs, we have very, very affordable packages that are available now. And so, uh, you know, take advantage of it. Talk to your Wimber rep. Uh, it's something that I think uh, a lot of schools are going to uh, take advantage of over the next, you know, six months or so. So, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you for uh, everyone for coming. If anybody.